it's on mute. That, is that better? Okay, cool. Okay, so um, today, uh, following on from uh, Tracy's excellent lectures, I'm going to talk about looking for dark matter. So in the previous lecture, we were talking about looking for new physics at much higher scales, not necessarily associated with dark matter at all. Here, we're going to talk about how we might actually look for dark matter in the lab. Now, you've heard in uh, Tracy's lectures about all the evidence for dark matter. But so far, that evidence is purely gravitational. It all comes from looking at the motion, presumably under gravity, of standard model matter on large scales in the universe. Uh, for all we know, dark matter may interact purely gravitationally. And in that case, it's going to be extremely difficult to get any more information about it, apart from these better astrophysical probes. But like, uh, like you learned in the previous lecture, there are lots of uh, well-motivated models for example, electroweak scale particles of various kinds, the QCD axion, and uh, production mechanisms for dark matter, such as the thermal freeze-out mechanism that you were taken through, where you naturally do have a coupling to standard model particles, which is uh, more than just the necessary gravitational coupling. And if you have that, then you can try to look for the effects of this in the lab. We presumably have some local dark matter density. We've certainly measured dark matter uh, density in the sort of local environment of the galaxy, meaning the sort of nearest few kiloparsecs or so, and in almost all settings, unless something extremely strange is going on, there's dark matter floating around uh, in the neighborhood of our solar system and usually through us at this very moment. So if this interacts uh, with standard model matter through non-gravitational means, we can try and probe this new interaction via the lab, via things in laboratories. Okay, so the usual way in which you hear about this and the sort of best developed experimental pr program so far is the program looking for WIMPs, looking for heavy particles which will very occasionally slam into a standard model uh, nucleus or particle or atom and leave a lot of energy which you can then detect. So they have these massive underground detectors now reaching multi-ton scales in which they're looking for these very rare events. And... That program has been an extremely impressive experimental uh, achievement and has ruled out many models, but there are still things in which it can potentially find. And that's, I think, something that you'll be hearing about tomorrow a bit in Tracer's lectures. What I'm going to talk about is uh, a somewhat different experimental program looking for much lighter dark matter, in particular the kind of light bosonic dark matter that's you heard about exemplified by things like the QCD axion, where instead of thinking of dark matter discrete particles, it's more like something like a radio wave, some coherent oscillation that is high occupation number. Um, and for those kind of things, there are very different ways of trying to look for this kind of dark matter. So, um, yeah, I guess just as a sort of... Uh, general introduction to the sort of parametrics we're thinking about and to uh, sort of follow on from the calculations that Tracy was doing um, earlier today. So like she was saying, one of the ways in which the easiest ways to get uh, a population of light bosonic dark matter is through what's called the misalignment mechanism. So in the early universe set up by inflation or whatever, let's say we have a scalar field phi. We have that phi is approximately equal to some constant value phi zero at early times. So throughout the whole universe, then once the Hubble scale is less than order of the mass of this particle, it starts oscillating in its potential, and at later times, you get that it's... Uh, suppressed by 2 to the minus uh, 3 over 2, sorry, 3 over 2 there. So you get some uh, dilution of this thing as uh, the universe expands, and you have some fast oscillation as well. Okay, so in the more... You, so Tracy took you through the case of QCD axion, where you have a very definite uh, prediction for the mass of this thing, and you have some kind of prediction for the initial 
abundance, but just more generally, if we allow these things to be whatever, what kind of values do we get? Okay, so let's try and look at the time of matter radiation equality, say, because that's an easy time to compare things and see what the abundance we've got is. Okay, so at A of matter radiation equality, we've got the tower energy density in our phi field. So this is parametrically set by m phi squared, m phi squared, phi squared. Uh, then you've got the kinetic term, which just takes out the oscillating part of that. So this is m phi squared, phi zero squared. Uh, in radiation domination, the scale factor goes like the temperature up to numerical factors on the number of species. So this is then T equality over the temperature at which it starts oscillating, all to the uh, 3 over 2. Uh, so that's parametrically number density that we're going to get. The time at which it starts oscillating is when Hubble is of order m phi. So we've got that Hubble oscillation squared, which is m phi squared. And that should be our T oscillation to the 4 over m Planck squared. So just to explain this, this comes from the, FR, the equations from FRW universe. You've got that your Hubble parameter squared is 8 pi g over 3 uh, times the energy density. G is 1 over m Planck squared. Your energy density parametrically goes as t to the 4. So that's where this kind of thing is coming from. So just going over the same kind of calculation, but just sort of repeating it. In a, carry on. Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. So we want, uh, yeah, so we want m phi squared to be of order the Hubble, uh, which it starts oscillating squared. And this, by the FRW equations, uh, is proportional to the t at which it starts oscillating to the 4 over m Planck squared. OK, so plugging this all back in here, that means that our energy density in this field, so we've got our m phi squared phi 0 squared. We've got our the equality there to our, um, oh, sorry, we, ha we don't have the twos, of course, because we squared it all. Apologies. The equality cubed. And then we've got our, um, so our T osc there was our m phi squared m Planck squared. Now, so that was to the 4, so we want this to the 3 over 4. So putting this all together, we get that our thing is m phi to the half, phi 0 squared, divided by the equality, m Planck to the 3 over 2, times t equality to the 4. So this is the characteristic energy density of both matter and radiation around uh, matter radiation equality. Again, we're ignoring numerical constants. This is just to give you parametric field things. So plugging in numbers, this is t equality to the quarter. We'll plug in some, uh, so if we take this to be as low as it can be, so around 10 to the minus 19 EV, I think Tracy talked a bit about how structure formation means that both line dark matter can't be too light, otherwise things start going wrong. And then the phi zero that we get out should be about 10 to the 16 GV in order to make this work. So the point about writing this is just to illustrate that in general, so fairly in general, uh, not just in the QCD axion case, which is a sort of specific example where you have slightly funny behavior, um, if you, you want that your dark matter particle is light and you want the scales associated with at least its initial value to be rather large. And this points you towards the kind of models where you naturally have some light particle with coupling suppressed by some large scale physics, such as the QCD axion, and the same kind of thing can occur in a number of other models. So we're looking at those kind of models. And like I said, that leads you towards things that can be good dark matter candidates because they are light and weakly coupled, so stable, and they can be cold dark matter through this kind of misalignment mechanism. Okay, so 
Now we want to talk about, okay, how are we going to try and detect these things in the lab? So we have some oscillating background field, which is just all around us. How are we going to try and detect it? So in the QCD axion case, what we did was we took our theta CP, which cut with our term, which uh, in a standard model Lagrangian with a GG, GG tilde, and we promoted this to some field where it was now theta CP plus some axion field, which depends on time and space. So the simplest form of couplings is a generalization of this. So we've got other terms in the standard model Lagrangian. For example, we have the uh, kinetic term for the uh, photon. And this has got usually a value of a quarter. If uh, we stick and we promote this to a field, so we've got some phi of t, of course, this is uh, divided by some scale f, phi of t and x over some scale lambda, then we have some interaction of this field phi with the standard model in a different way. Similarly, if we, we can interact with phi times the fermions, giving varying fermion masses, etc. So with this general idea occurs in many kinds of theories. The standard model couplings, which look constant, can also have influences from fields which vary in space and time. So in particular, a dark matter field which is oscillating will look like, in a lab, like an oscillation of what we think of as fundamental standard model constants. So how do we try and look for this? Well, basically, we just sort of take the kind of techniques that we use to perform extremely precise measurements within the standard model and modify those to look for things like oscillations. And uh, one of the most precise... Oh, sorry. Notes are out of order. Um, <laughs> well, uh, there we go. I will have to remember this part of the uh, talk because we have a slight uh, lack of notes for this. But, okay. So, um, <laughs> sorry, let me just see if it is lurking around anywhere. All right, well, these things happen. Anyway. <clears throat> Not quite what I expected. All right, so um, one, of the, one of the most precise kind of instruments we have are atomic clocks. So I'm going to talk a bit about how we can use those to look for um, this kind of time variation of fundamental constants. So an atomic clock is basically we want to very precisely um, measure time using uh, the fact that the transition energy of some atomic system, so we have, say, we have our atom, we have electrons going around, and then we have some excited state, which they can go up to, and this is associated with some energy splitting. And this energy splitting is uh, pretty robust, to external effects, uh, or can at least be made so by uh, making a very uh, clean environment in your laboratory. And the way that we can use this to measure time is, like we were talking about in the EDM experiments yesterday, an interference type experiment. So let's say that we have our two states, we'll call them uh, 0 and 1, and this one has energy E0, this one has energy E1, E0, plus delta E. Now, um, so let's say that we start with our atom in our ground state, E0. We then kick it in some way. We apply some laser field whatever in a way that 
is called a pi of a 2 pulse, which is exactly set up so that it does the following transformation. So it does on our state. It's initial, this is our 0 state. This is our 1. So it takes our 0 state and it puts it into a superposition of being in the ground state and in the excited state. So that's the first step. We need to set up our superposition. Now, once we've done this, we leave it there for some amount of time. So after time t, this goes to 1 over root 2, of course, e to the i e0 t, just the usual phase evolution. But the excited state has accumulated some extra phase relative to the ground state. Now, if we try and bring it back, we apply the inverse operation to this. So we take our 1 over root 2, 1 minus 1, 1, 1, to our new state, which is up to phase just our uh, 1 and our e to the i delta e t. Then we get our 0 and uh, minus 1. And then we get the part which includes the extra phase. So then our 0 plus 1. OK. And so expanding all this out, we've got that uh, our 1 over 1 plus e to the i delta t in the original state, and then our e to the i delta t e <coughs> delta e t minus 1 over 2 in the excited state. So if, if the phase that we, if the delta e was small, or rather, okay, we can just expand this out in sines and cosines. So this is just our, so 1 plus cos, delta t, et cetera. But if the phase is small, then this is approximately just our 0 state minus, sorry, plus i delta e t over 2 times our other state. So we see that we have a transition probability from this. The probability that we went from in this whole sequence of pulse, leave it, and then pulse again, this gives us a transition probability from the initial ground state into ground state into excited state, which depends on the energy splitting and the time that we left it. So this kind of thing is basically at the basis of uh, atomic clocks being able to tell very precise time. For an energy splitting, which is typical for, say, an optical transition, so our delta E of order electron volts there, then uh, delta E times T is of order 10 to the 15 if T is a second. So any, even a tiny like, difference in time leads to a large difference in phase. So that's effectively, this is the large number that's coming in. OK, but we're not actually going to use it to tell time. We're going to try and see if there are any extra contributions to this that we didn't expect just in the standard model. Yeah. Um, you should, so you, the way you'd implemented it is that you'd shine a laser at it, which was uh, tuned to the frequency of the transition. So what, in all of these things, I should say that you, don't, you want this state to be uh, rather stable. If it decayed during the time that you were leaving it, that screws your whole thing up. So this state should be, so the transition from here to here should be some forbidden transition, which means it doesn't want to do it spontaneously, but if you hit it, with a large enough number of photons, i.e. a laser, at exactly the right frequency, then just through Rabi oscillations, you will transfer some of the amplitude for it from the initial state into this state. So you hit it with a laser pulse at the correct amplitude and duration to give you this exact Rabi oscillation. Um, how sensitive is this to like, how long the pulse is? Like, if you have pi plus minus delta k, yeah. then what is like, the leading correction in that? Um, so I mean, we can just put this all in here. 
and you'll find that it comes out as, I mean, that'll give you, basically give you, if you had an extra angle in here, it'll give you an extra angle between these. So this is, this is like an angle phi. Some area here will give you an angle like that. So in these sequences, you generally want to be very careful that, yes, you're implementing it in some way that is robust to your, the lasers that you're using, having some noise or having some offset, et cetera. So there are, of course, many experimental details to do with rejecting laser noise, doing it in some way that that all cancels out in the final measurement, et cetera. But uh, this is the sort of extremely schematic overview of what happens. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, interferometry experiment, in some sense, that an atomic clock represents. So how can we try and use this to look for um, variation of our constants? So the overall point is going to be that the energy splitting uh, of the levels of our atom or whatever is going to depend on the standard model parameters. It's going to depend on, so delta E depends on alpha EM. It depends on the mass of the electron. It depends on the mass of the proton, etc. All of these things. So if we vary them, so our delta E is going to be our delta E zero plus so our dark matter field phi of T and X over lambda times our cos M phi T, where we have some constants out here plus dot, 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 where this parameterizes how sensitive this particular energy level is to the variation. Now, of course, if all of your uh, energy levels changed in the same way, that'd be rather hard to tell. You'd have one clock was going a bit faster than another, but how, well, no, sorry, one clock was going a bit faster, but all the other clocks were going faster as well. So it'd be rather hard to tell the difference there. You'd need to have one area with a different dark matter density compared to another or something. That'd be difficult. But helpfully, different transitions depend on the constants on alpha, ME, MP, etc., in different ways. For example, if we have um, a transition between different radial levels of an atom, then the energy of the state with radial number n minus the one with n primed is uh, something that goes as, well, again, I've lost my uh, <laughs> things with all the actual numbers in, but approximately this is our e to the 4 mass of the electron over stuff with pi's, 1 over n squared minus 1 over n prime squared in the usual Bohr model way. Whereas if we have a hyperfine splitting, so delta E hyperfine, this depends on the spin-spin interaction. So we've got a dependence on 1 over Me and 1 over the nucleon, the proton mass that's giving you the uh, Bohr magneton for the nucleon times appropriate dimensional things, so Bohr radius cubed or whatever. So when we work all that out, we're going to get something that depends on uh, the mass of the electron and the mass of the proton in different ways, and E, the electron charge, to a different power as well. Of course, with many constants here. So if we have different levels which depend, different splittings, which depend on the constants in different ways, then if we take sort of delta E1 over delta E2, then this will be, uh, say that this goes as alpha to some power, like uh, alpha to the 4. Then if alpha, say that we have some alpha variation, which is alpha 0, 1 plus uh, g alpha, phi, cos stuff, then this will mean that this has some variation in time, which is four times this thing. So we get some oscillation of the frequency ratio of these transitions, which will vary in time. So if we have two different clocks, depending on two different transitions, then we can compare them. There's technology for do now doing this is a rather tricky thing, but there is technology to do that extremely precisely. Frequency, com frequency comparisons are one of the uh, easiest things to do in a lab for reasons that are somewhat technical, but uh, are extremely good these days. 
So we can do that and uh, try and look for this signal. Then the question is, okay, what kind of precision can we actually expect if, we, if we're going to do this? So, okay, from all this, we had that our um, probability in one, of these in one of these interferometry sequences of getting a transition goes as delta E times T. So if we have some setup where in the usual case, we wouldn't have got any transition, we've tuned that all back. So we've got a sensitivity to extraneous influences of one part in about 10 to the 15, if we're running this for a second or so, which is about what you do. So we can tell a phi zero over lambda thing of about 10 to the minus 15 from a single such thing. And if we do it n times in the usual way, we can get some improved sensitivity going as root n. So about 10 to the minus 15 over the number of things we do. If we do like this every second for a year, this gives us something a few times 10 to the minus 19 sensitivity. So potential for extremely sensitive fractional changes on uh, these things. So what kind of values will this parameter actually have? So we got that the dark matter density goes as m phi squared phi zero squared. Locally, as I assume Tracy has uh, talked about a bit, this is around uh, a GV per centimeter cubed, at least in the sort of few kiloparsecs around us in the galaxy. And if we assume that, as in these models, it's very much expected, the dark matter is pretty smooth, then the value around the Earth should be this as well. So that means that our phi zero value should be the square root of this over the mass. So this means that if we evaluate our phi zero over lambda value, then this gives us uh, putting in some numbers. So this is our delta rho over m phi lambda. So if we take lambda to be of order the Planck scale, just a comparison, and we take m phi to correspond to an oscillation of, uh, on the scale of minutes, which is the kind of thing that we could easily see if we were doing some kind of clock comparison over m phi, then the number we get is about 10 to the minus 14. So that is very encouraging. So what that's telling us is that we definitely, for very low mass things, as we're going to talk about a bit in the next lecture, more than gravitational strength interactions are very dangerous because there are very sensitive tests you can do that will actually show up the effects of those, whether they're dark matter or not. But this kind of estimate is telling us that even if these things are significantly more weakly coupled to us through these kind of operators than gravity is, so they stand a chance of evading the non-dark matter bounds, then these kind of tests could still have orders of magnitude of sensitivity reach to see them. So these kind of comparisons are being done between extremely precise clocks of different kinds and are starting to uh, put constraints on these kind of models. Now, of course, there are many experimental issues which this completely glosses over. This is the uh, extremely zeroth order picture. You need to be extremely careful that no other uh, external influences come in and mess up the evolution of your superposition. And you also need to be sure that you know exactly what initial state you start in. If your atom has some additional motional motion, then that will uh, lead to redshift, which can swamp this. If there are some additional magnetic fields or whatever, then that can lead to things screwing up. So it's extremely uh, difficult. Sorry. Yes. I have a question. At one point, I assume lambda is the order of the decay constant. So in an axion model, lambda would be of order of the decay constant, yes, or with some constants out front. In other models, this will be the scale of new physics of some other form. You might not call it the decay constant. But yes, this is generically going to be a, at least the new physics scale, maybe with some extra suppressions as well. Oh, no. So that's for axion-like couplings. As we'll, so this is kind of leaping ahead, but as we'll talk about tomorrow, couplings of this kind, uh, or couplings to uh, like fermion masses or whatever, are actually subject to much, much stronger constraints for low-mass particles. Um, unlike an axion, 
they will show up in things like equivalence principle tests, which we'll talk about, and so they can't actually exist, even if they're not dark matter in the spectrum at low masses, unless their couplings are extremely subgravitational. So yeah, that's the difference between axion-like couplings and others which aren't, for example, shift symmetric. Yes. So um, you might, in terms of the UV standard model, but say the feed through into the electron mass would have your cars and things in. Um, there will be additional parameters which lend to which can very easily make these small enough to be OK. So, OK, so that's a sort of extremely uh, high level tour of one of the ways in which uh, extremely precise experiments can be used to try and look for low mass dark matter. So. The other, another kind of example, which uh, points you towards somewhat different techniques, is the one that uh, Tracy gave you an, a very nice introduction to earlier, which is the QCD axion. So there, you have a somewhat different scenario in that you have basically only one free parameter. You have that your axion couples to the gluon field strength, uh, so the gluon GG tilde in the standard model, and that implies, due to the anomaly, that the axion gets a mass, which is of order, being, extreme, being even more rough than the previous lecture, lambda QCD squared over V decay constant FA. And then misalignment production we now no longer have two free parameters, we only have the one free parameter implies that we get the correct dark matter abundance. So if the initial theta angle was 1, the correct FA that we need is about 10 to the 11 GeV, which corresponds to an axion mass somewhere around 10 to the minus 4 EV. Now, of course, like Tracy was saying, if we allow somewhat different values for the initial uh, angle of this thing, we can go to higher FA, smaller mass, and be okay. If you look at the production mechanism through uh, post-inflationary symmetry breaking, you can go to higher masses, things will still be okay. But we're still in the regime where we only have one parameter, the mass or the coupling, depending on how you want to put it, and there is a natural sort of target region in that mass place, which is, in particular, corresponds to frequencies of around uh, 10 gigahertz. So we're looking at frequencies much, much higher than the kind of things you can get for like the clock experiments or the measurement, generally measurements of fundamental constants. Those are done with long time scales, like seconds or so, to get you the highest possible precision. Here, the thing is oscillating at gigahertz, so in these kind of experiments, the effect will completely cancel out. So you need to use very different kind of techniques to uh, see this. So now ideally, we just want to use this coupling. This is the thing that defines the QCD axion. So I should say QCD axiom. And this is the thing that's guaranteed to be there. But looking at nuclei at gigahertz frequencies is somewhat awkward. The sort of natural frequency corresponding to nuclear spins, so we have the nuclear magnetic moment, which is of order E over 2 times the mass of the nucleon. And even in the biggest B fields that we can, we can produce of order Tesla, this is about 3 times 10 to the minus 8 EV. So much, much lower frequencies than this. So there's a bit of a frequency mismatch of nuclear spins, and nuclear excitations themselves are much higher energies. So doing things with nuclei at gigahertz frequencies is kind of awkward. So instead, it makes sense to try and look at the other, kind of other couplings that the QCD axiom might have. So we've got the, uh, this term, writing it out properly. We've got factors of alpha s over 4 pi in the usual definition, et cetera, g, g tilde. The other thing that you naturally get coming along for the ride is a coupling to the photon through loops. So you have this c factor here, and then you have the f, f tilde, where this is the uh, Maxwell field strength tensor. So this kind of thing in the low energy standard model has a nat is naturally around 10 to the minus 3 just from uh, 
integrate, well, effectively integrating it out uh, pions. The fact that the QCD, QCD matter is also charged under EM means that you naturally get a value somewhere around there. It can be tuned to be smaller if you add in additional contributions from high scales, but naturally it comes out around that. And you also, somewhat more modeling, model dependently, have couplings to fermions. So you've got couplings to the various standard model fermions through pseudoscalar operator. So the thing that is sort of most natural and most generic at gigahertz H frequencies is to try and look for it, the QCD axion, through its coupling to photons. Now, so what's, what does this coupling look like and what are its effects? So, if we expand it out in terms of electric and magnetic fields, the uh, photon coupling, so our A, F, mu nu, F tilde mu nu, is equal to uh, minus for A, E dot B, where these are just the usual E and B fields. Now, just an aside, this form is perhaps somewhat worrying because it looks as though uh, you've actually got some term that depends on the axion value itself, not just on its derivative. And wouldn't that then contribute to the mass of things? But the answer is no, because as for the QCD thing, this is a total derivative. So our FF tilde is, if we expand it out, d mu, a nu, f tilde, mu nu, where well, I've ignored constants and things. So we can integrate by parts in the Lagrangian and transfer this derivative to the A field. So it is still a shift symmetric coupling. Now, the same is true of the QCD thing, but there we have topological structure, which means that uh, doing that integration by parts encounters issues in infinity. For standard model electromagnetism, there are no such issues, and for a constant value of the A field, this has no effect. So everything's okay there. This doesn't give any uh, extra weirdness. Okay, but what does it do experimentally? What this means is that uh, we have some, if we have a low velocity axion field, it looks like some effective current density J axion here, which is going to be set by our, we'll call it G, which is our C over F, A, as defined down here times our dt of our A field times the magnetic field. So if we have a big magnetic background magnetic field, then the time derivative of the axion will correspond to what looks like an effective current density, and this oscillating current density can drive, can source photons, which we can then try and look for. Okay, so how might we try and do that? The most sort of naive thing you might try and do uh, turns out to be pretty much the best thing to do, and the thing that uh, is currently the most sensitive way of looking for QCD axions in the gigahertz mass range. So we make some cavity where the length scale of this cavity is of order the inverse mass scale of our um, axion. So if it's gigahertz ish range, then we're looking at something which is of order tens of centimeters or so. And we have a big background magnetic field inside this cavity. In diagram terms, this coupling corresponds to an axion coupling to two photons. So one of these photons we can take from the magnetic field, and then this axion current due to this magnetic field background will be able to drive a uh, the creation of photons inside the cavity. So what's the rate of this, and uh, can we hope to see it? So the interaction Hamiltonian that we have for our system, so integrate over the volume, we've got our G A B dotted with our E field. And so we'll take the B to be our big background B field. So we've got this. 
So in the presence of an oscillating axion field, then the power that is being delivered from the axion to the cavity is set by the time derivative of the forcing, so g dt a, b0, dot whatever the fields in the cavity are. So that's how much power the, uh, is being exchanged between the axion field and the things in the cavity. The power that we're losing from the cavity is just set by the quality factor. That's what we mean by the quality factor of the cavity. A high quality factor cavity is something with low losses. So the power that we lose is the energy stored in the cavity times by the frequency divided by the quality factor. So schematically, this is of order the E field in the cavity squared times the volume times the frequency divided by the quality factor. OK, so if we've reached uh, some equilibrium, if we've left it long enough for the axion to ring up the oscillation in the cavity, then we can equate these two things. So parametrically, this input power was of order the volume times g times the frequency times the axion uh, amplitude times the B field times the E field. OK, so P in of order P loss implies that the E field in our cavity is of order the quality factor times our G coupling times our axion uh, amplitude times our B field. And so after all of this stuff, we get that the power which we're getting from our dark matter signal is set by <coughs> combination of the coupling, the amplitude, and the background B field times the volume of our cavity times the frequency, which is just the axion mass here, times the quality factor of our thing. OK, so we've got the sort of parametrics of it. What does this actually come out to for the QCD axion numbers that we care about? So plugging things in, we've got that uh, from before, we had that our G was approximately 10 to the minus 3 over FA in sort of... Uh, untuned things, well, 10 to the minus 3 slash 10 to the minus 4 or so, depending. And we had that our uh, rho axion was m axion squared amplitude of axion field squared parametrically, which was our local dark matter density of around GV per centimeter cubed. And we have our axion mass in terms of the coupling. So putting all that together, the power that we get out is 5 times 10 to the minus 21 watt. If we have a B field of Tesla-ish strength, which is like a big but entirely doable laboratory B field. If we have a quality factor of the cavity of a million or so, again, big but doable. Volume of around meter cubed and an FA of 10 to the 11 GV-ish, which is around where we're interested in. OK, so that sounds small, but how big is it? If we put it in terms of the mass of the axion, which is also the energy of the photons that we're getting out, because we only have one frequency in the problem, then this comes out to 500 hertz or so with all of this list of parameters. So we see that we have 500 signal photons per second, which is not a crazy number. Now, of course, it means that you need to cool your cavity down a lot, such that black body photons are not coming in at this rate. It means that you need to be very careful that your amplifiers are not injecting more noise than this, etc. But if you have a, a quant, if you have a setup which doesn't have any extra limitations, which you can almost realize now at the microwave level, you have uh, almost quantum limited amplifiers you can cool down such that your black body photons are almost not there. They're a very, very low number. So 
This is doable. And indeed, the ADMX experiment which does pretty much exactly this. So that has some uh, frequency. So uh, MA over 2 pi around a gigahertz is where it's searching for, corresponding to um, FA of around 10 to the 12 GV. It's sensitive to powers of around uh, 10 to the minus 20, well, depending on where exactly you are, 10 to the minus 22 watts. So it is able to take out a decent chunk of the QCD axion parameter space range. Now, of course, I've skimmed over. You need to scan, oh, you need to change the, the properties of your cavity such that you're resonant at the right frequency, etc. You need to scan over all the different configurations. But in this kind of frequency range, getting to QCD axion sensitivity is doable and is being done. So if we plot out, so this is mass of the axion, and this is uh, our coupling. The QCD axion uh, band is some sort of untuned space, which is, so we have the usual MA proportional to 1 over FA relationship. So G is proportional to 1 over FA. There's some band in which the coupling to photons might plausibly be given uh, a particular FA. And then, which I think Matt will talk about a bit more in his lectures, you have bounds which don't depend on the axon being dark matter. So if the coupling to photons was too big, then you'd be ruled out by observations of stars and various other things. So at frequencies of uh, gigahertz or so, ADMX has taken out some chunk of the parameter space in which QCD axions could be dark matter with this photon coupling. So the uh, explanation has actually reached a very interesting regime. Now, of course, uh, the, mass that we, the mass that we're looking for wasn't set in stone. There is some uncertainty even with, with the misalignment mechanism. There's uncertainty as to what uh, initial theta value would be there. And like Tracy was saying, there's very definitely uncertainty as to if you uh, go beyond that and you're looking at production after inflation, then everything becomes more complicated and you could live over a wider mass range above that. So at lower mass ranges, this would be quote unquote tuned misalignment. Though the tuning is not that severe and there are various you might make anthropic arguments as to why this tuning shouldn't worry you. And up in the higher parameter space regime, higher mass regime, post-inflation reproduction may well be uh, able to take you up to higher masses. OK, so this is, ADMX, et cetera, is extremely interesting, but it would be very nice to explore the rest of the parameter space regime and see whether we can um, either rule out or find QCD axion dark matter there. So there are a, lot of there are a number of experimental concepts down in the lower mass region, um, some of which even attempt to look for this coupling, which is guaranteed to be there. But... Uh, those are of a rather different kind of nature, and I won't have time to talk about them here. So one thing that I will talk about a bit is how might we try and extend this reach upwards in mass? How might we try and look for QCD axions at masses above the few gigahertz range? So there, we'll try and look at the photon coupling again, because that's the most convenient thing to look for at high frequencies. The parametric sort of power calculations that we did before still hold, and because we have that FA is proportional to MA, if we do this P over MA calculation, this cancels, and it turns out to be, for the parameters as before, a B field of a Tesla, volume of a meter cubed, et cetera, et cetera, you get that this is 500 hertz for 
whatever axion mass you're looking at. So as you go up in masses, you're still getting the same number of photons per second out of your hypothetical apparatus. So it's certainly not the scaling as such that you could certainly hope to see decent signals here if you're seeing signals at ADMX. However, there is a difficulty. And that difficulty is effectively momentum conservation. So in the case of ADMX, uh, we only worry about matching the frequency of the axion to the frequency of the cavity that we're in. The cavity mode just has that frequency because it's a low-lying mode of the cavity and the cavity is the right geometry. But if we have a volume of a meter, say a meter or so, and we have a frequency of much larger than gigahertz, then the wavelength of photons that we'll be trying to that we convert from axions into photons will be much smaller than a meter. So we've got that our lambda much much less than meter, and that's an issue. So if we draw out the dispersion relation of things, then in a big volume, the dispersion relation of photons is basically that they live on the light cone. So they have omega approximately equal to k. But axions are non-relativistic. They, we've got that they have an energy approximately set by their mass. Their velocity is of order 10 to the minus 3 or so. So the range of possible axial momenta is rather restricted. It's only things which are almost just clustered around here. So if we want to convert to a photon, at the same energy, then a photon at the same energy has a momentum that looks like this. So we have this difference to make up. If we drew it out in a, a proper 3D sense, we'd have our light cone, which is actually a cone now, and then we'd have our axion mass shell, and the axions would live here. So we'd want to convert from like there to here. Axion momentum, photon momentum, so P gamma, P axion. So you've got this mismatch set by G. So what this is telling us, so P gamma, P axion. So we've got some momentum which we've lost here of order the axion mass scale. So we need to make this up somehow. And the easiest way to do that is to have some structure of your target at a scale scale lambda, which is of order ma inverse. The most naive way to do that would be to just say, OK, well, I can just make tons of little cavities. I can make a whole load of them, each about wavelength size, and run all the leads of them to the same amplifier. So we just take it all out, run a load of wires back and forth, and do that. Theoretically, that would work, but that would be extremely awkward experimentally. If you're trying to fill a meter with cavities of like millimeter size or even smaller, then all the wiring and the construction becomes an absolute mess. So what can you try to do? So one answer to that is instead of using cavities, is to use some kind of structured material. So what in the optical range are called photonic materials. And in the very simplest form, these things are just periodic structures where, let's say we have a load of disks, and Each of these disks have different um, refractive indices. So refractive indices N1, N2, N1, N2, etc. Oh, N2, N1. Now, in a medium which is effectively periodic, uh, you don't have the usual, so in free space, 
you've got that uh, EM waves just look like harmonic functions, like e to the, so e of x would be e to the i k dot x. It'll just look like sines and cosines. In a periodic medium, you have instead block waves. You have that you've got your harmonic part, but then also multiplied by some uh, function which is periodic with the period of your material. So let's look at a particular example. Let's say that we have a effectively one-dimensional medium, and let's take this example here. So we have some part of space which has refractive index M1, some part which has refractive index N2. Now, in the first part, this is basically just like free space, so we have a sine wave type behavior there. Say that this is the value of the E field. Then, at the interface, this is, say, 0, and this is whatever values. This is continuous here at 0, and the derivative has also got to be continuous if the material isn't magnetically active. So we've got to have continuity of this and the derivative, so it just goes through like that. Now, in this space, it's also part of a sine wave, and it's got to get to 0 here. So to match that up, it must be just a scaled-down version of this one, where the ratio of these is uh, m1 to n2. So we have a periodic function that instead of looking like a pure sine wave in free space, which would be just like this would be x, this would be the E field, we've got something which has got some uh, different structure. Now, OK, how does that help us? The problem of momentum mismatch can be rephrased as saying that if we look at our interaction Hamiltonian, so our was equal to the volume integral of our g a e dot b. So if we have an effectively constant b field, let's say our b field is just in the uh, z direction or whatever throughout, then in the free space case, the e field in this part is in the upward direction, the e field in this part is in the downward direction, so each dip period cancels in its contribution to the uh, overall interaction Hamiltonian. So free space, this is approximately equal to zero because you get cancellation across all the different periods. However, in the case of uh, the example where we've modified it through some uh, periodic material, then this part has a higher amplitude than this part. So integrating across a single period, we only get a small, we only get some non-cancelling component. So periodic, it turns out that what we get goes as 1 over m1 minus 1 over n2. So if we have an order 1 refractive index contrast between our two different regimes, then we get a non-cancelling part here, and the overall interaction is, again, just scaling with volume. We get order 1 overlap. So we can then plug everything back into here. The parametrics of this are just that it goes as the volume times the average field times B0. And we can get back to this kind of uh, 500 photons per second value that we were getting just from a cavity. So this kind of thing is uh, something that's being pursued across multiple different mass ranges. So in the regime just above ADMX, so at tens of gigahertz up to hundreds of gigahertz, the uh, Mad Max experiment is a proposal to do exactly this using a series of uh, dielectric disks. So you just take your uh, vol you take a sort of shielded volume, you put a load of disks like this, you put a mirror at one end, and then in the presence of a magnetic field, which is perpendicular to the disks, so you've got a B0 in this direction, then 
a background axon oscillation will cause photons to be emitted, which will then collect onto a receiver and try and see them. So this is one way of trying to uh, get around this limitation of momentum conservation. Uh, at higher frequencies, there are various materials which can be fabricated. Sorry, Karen. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so the um, deviation from that that you'll allow will set effectively the effective quality factor of the uh, system that you're making. So if you have things which are spaced out, um, okay, what's the right way to put this? So yes, if you're going to try and make a narrower frequency response than the dispersion due to the axion velocity, then that is A, difficult in these cases, and B, not always helpful, because you're missing out on some of the power. There are circumstances where you want to do it, but yes, that sets a natural limit to how sharp you want to make your frequency response, because otherwise, the axion will be at frequencies outside where your experiment responds, and you'll be missing out on the power that will be coming from there. So yes, that sets a natural cutoff in many cases. Was that the... Yes. Uh, I, I'm still excited modes, but I guess the thing I'm only excited modes that are like yeah. single peak over the entire Yeah. Exactly. So for ADMX, a, the lowest line cavity modes have an E field profile which look, looks something like this. So if we look at it, so this is like E, sorry, mixing up spatial dimensions and E field dimensions somewhat. Yeah. So across the cavity, the E field will vary by, say, uh, one half a period. So in that case, the overlap, as in if we take E dot B integrated across the whole volume, will be order one of average E field or average B field. If we take a higher order mode of that cavity, the E field will look like... So the integral of that against the constant B field will be very much smaller than average E field dot average B field. Whereas if it has this form instead, then it will again be back to small suppression, average E field dot average B field. So that's where that's coming from. OK. Um, so yeah, so there, that is just to give an illustration of one technique which you can try to use to push up uh, the search to higher frequencies and probe some, of the other, probe some of the range which is potentially also allowed from uh, early universe production mechanisms. Uh, like I said, there's also another story which is um, even more sort of various, varied uh, low frequencies, because then you can more easily go after the couplings to nuclei and things, but uh, that would be somewhat of a separate discussion. So, um, yeah, any, any questions on the axion detection side of things at this point? Okay, um, well, if not, then um, move on a bit to talking about uh, looking for dark matter scattering. So, Yes, uh, sorry. What, what mass scales are found for the Oh, yes, sorry. I realized I didn't label the y-axis. That is unhelpful. OK, so like I said, I think this will be talked about a bit in the BSM lectures, but just to give a very brief preview of it. So the, the FA that we're talking about here, um, so we're talking about for ADMX, uh, FA of order 10 to the 12 GeV or something. So we're looking at 10 to the minus, uh, say, 50, 10 to the 1 over 10 to the 15 GeV or so for our coupling to photons down here. The constraints from astrophysics, so from uh, supernovae, horizontal branch stars, things like that, come out at about 1 over 10 to the 10 GeV. Now, they tend to work independent of the mass. The basic point there is they're coming from processes such as 
you have high energy photons and high energy uh, electrons, say, inside stars. So we have a high energy photon come in, a high energy electron come in. They can interact through this kind of diagram. So this is like gamma, electron, electron, axion. This is called Primakov production. And then the point is that you will have this axion, because it interacts so weakly, will just escape from the star entirely. So, it's like neutrinos in the sun. If you have a neutrino produced in the hot solar core, then we have the star, we've got the hot core, we produce a neutrino there, and it just makes its way out with very high probability, it won't interact with anything else in the star. That energy will just go off out into the universe. In the same way, if we produce an axion through this kind of interaction, it will just, again, make its way through the rest of the star with very high probability, not interact with anything, and that energy is lost into the rest of the universe. And the fact that you have this mechanism for energy to be lost from the core means that you have a, a change in the stellar structure. There's, uh, you can solve for what the uh, pressure and temperature, etc., throughout the star should be, and the fact that it's losing energy from the core means that it should look a bit different than our models predict. And because our models match very well to the, so the structure of the sun, the structure of other stars, and to a lesser extent our understanding of supernovae, we can put bounds on how much energy you can lose through axions. Basically, it's got to be less than if you've got to lose through neutrinos, because otherwise everything screws up. So the comparison is usually to neutrino loss. So coming back to this, this is telling us that as long as if the mass of the axion is much, much less than the temperature of the core, then in this process, these things are coming in with energy approximately set by the temperature, so the axion mass is unimportant. And the temperature at the core of the massive stars that provide the best constraints is of order 10 keV. Whereas, remember down here, we're looking at 10 to the minus uh, 4, well, 10 to the minus 5-ish eV. So all of these masses are almost negligible from the point of view of the temperature inside the core of a star. So you get this, these constraints don't care about this mass at all. They hold down, they hold down to small masses and way up to much higher masses. So that's why they have this form of just a flat line here. So um, yeah, this sets the point below which you want to look if you're looking doing a dark matter experiment to have any chance of seeing it, because these constraints apply whether you're dark matter or you're not. But for the QCD axion, it also means that you're safe. Uh, they only overlap with the actual line somewhere around a mass of EV or so. So a QCD axion of match, mass significantly less than EV is not significantly constrained through the photon coupling. Generically, it also have couplings to nuclei, which means that at a mass less than around 50 milliEV, uh, it's safe. But at higher masses, supernovae will produce it too much. But um, yeah, this kind of transpose regime is safe. You can, can't really see it through production just independent of the dark matter abundance. You want to look for the dark matter abundance in the lab or in other astrophysical systems to stand a chance of seeing it. So the Mad Max experiment is looking at so ADMX is around a gigahertz. There are other cavity experiments which are basically ADMX high frequency, the same kind of thing, which go up to around, so I'll make a bigger graph here. So, yeah, frequency, which I'll call nu A. So ADMX is somewhere around a gigahertz. Then ADMX high frequency, which these days I think is called haystack, for political reasons or something, um, is looking around the sort of few to 10 gigahertz regime. So around 10 gigahertz. Then Mad Max is planning to look from around around sort of tens of gigahertz 
to around hundreds of gigahertz. Where it's, this is not a built experiment yet, so uh, we'll see where it actually ends up doing that. But yes, somewhere in the regime of a couple of orders of magnitude above ADMX. Now, there are also experiments using, uh, some of which I'm involved in, using the, materi the photonic material versions of this. So instead of actually just like positioning the disks by hand, you build some material that's naturally got some periodicity. And those are easiest to do way up at higher frequencies. So uh, scales which correspond to sort of uh, less than or order in EV. So just below the point at which the astrophysical balance is starting to come in. Now, you might say, okay, there's a bit of a gap here. So around sort of uh, terahertz frequencies, what's going on? So, yeah, photonic. Now, the issue is that it's certainly motivated to look here. It's, this is not, this is the, this is above the misalignment production mechanism range, but, uh, well, just above that, but it's certainly something you can uh, very easily imagine getting from various post-inflationary production mechanisms. The issue is that detectors are a real problem. At very high frequencies, you use photon detectors of the kind that are in your camera or something. Of course, much fancier versions, but we know how to detect infrared or optical photons. At microwave frequencies, there are well-developed technologies from things like radio astronomy, but also much fancier things developed for quantum information style of things, so things which almost look like qubits, and they're sensitive to even single photons around the gigahertz range. So we have detectors which are basically single photon good at the microwave range and in the sort of optical infrared range. But in between, <coughs> there's, <coughs> sorry, there's a real gap. And basically, this is set by <clears throat> the two technologies having different problems. Coming up from above, you have the superconductors you start become going above the superconducting gap of materials. So as microwave, uh, you can have very low loss things involving superconductors. But you try and extend that to sort of tera to in the far end of the terahertz range, <coughs> and you start breaking Cooper pairs and things. So your superconductors start becoming uh, less of a good thing to work with because you've got all kinds of lossy stuff going on. So all of the stuff around here is generally based on superconducting stuff, and that becomes a problem. Coming from below, you have the problem of effectively energy threshold. So the usual way in which a, a photon detector up here will work will be something like, say, you excite an electron hole pair in a, a semiconductor, or you will look at the temperature rise in a small superconductor, things like that. But all of those things require enough energy in your single photon in order to be able to see it. And that basically runs out once you go below somewhere around 50 milliEV or so. It becomes uh, too small such that you just all kinds of environmental crap is giving you the same kind of energy stuff. And filling this gap is a research pro program on multiple levels, both because it would be extremely interesting for physics through things like dark matter experiments and whatnot, but also because technologically, lots of people are interested in things here. Uh, people who are doing um, various sort of imaging type things, so like the things that you stand like that at the airport, uh, things which are trying to look at um, various biological processes, I think. So there is strong motivation for people to try and build new detectors in this range. And uh, there are a number of ideas, a lot of them based on either up-converting it to this range where you can see it, or down-converting it to this range where you can use the existing technologies. So yeah, eventually, unless we find something um, in either the lower mass range or the higher mass range, we will want to try and explore this sort of gap in the middle. And that's a technological challenge, but something that people are actively working on. So uh, we will see. OK, um, actually, yeah, I probably don't have time to start on a sort of whole new topic there. So yeah, are there any other questions on um, any, anything so far? OK, um, oh yeah. Yeah. 
So the Q factor is um, actually quite easy there because if you have a given configuration, you can always make the Q higher by taking, let's say we take our stack of material. If we have the stack of bare material, just like this, then the Q would be of order one over the number of periods. So a 100 period thing will give you Q of 100. Sorry, no, not one over. Number of periods. So the loss goes as one over the number of periods. So the quality factor goes like that. However, if you want to enhance the quality factor, all you do is you stick it in a sort of cavity. You stick it between two slightly, reflect, slightly transmissive mirrors. So it's very easy to take one of these things and up the queue. The reason why this is not uh, something you'd always want to do is that higher Q means that if we draw out in axion mass, so this is the mass of our axion, this is the power in our signal, if we have, say, 100 periods, then we'd have some thing that looked like this. We'd have a fractional mass range of order 1 over 100 in which we are sensitive, and the uh, <coughs> power that we get there is the Q boost is by a factor of 100 over, P, over some fiducial P0. If we go to a Q of 10 to the 5 or so by putting it inside a cavity, then we boost this to something, something 10 to the 5 or so. But we also restrict the range over it works to be 10 to the minus 5. So we'd need to change our configuration. This we need 100 steps throughout if we're going to do it this way. This one we need 10 to the 5. So the overall number of signal photons, if, the dark mat if we don't know the dark matter mass and we have to step through the entire range, is the same in both cases. Now, it can still be beneficial to use high Q. The reason why uh, things like ADMX do it is that all of your power is then coming in a single configuration. Whereas if you have noise photons, then those you see in all of the different things. So you're enhancing the signal to noise by in the configuration where you're actually tuned correctly by going to higher Q. That's not necessarily such a problem at the higher mass range because you can make extremely good single photon detectors with extremely low noise, and of course, black body radiation isn't so much of an issue there. So depending on what your noise properties are, it may or may not be a good idea to go to higher Q. At low frequencies, noise is still enough of an issue that high Q is a really good idea. So that's sort of, there's a trade-off there, and whether or not it makes sense to go to high Q or to lower Q depends on what your noise issues are. Um, yes, pretty much. Um, so it's just that we can look at... So our Q, remember, so our power out is something that's 1 over Q. So it's the energy stored, U in our system, times the frequency divided by Q. The energy stored is E squared times V. V is proportional to the number of layers. Uh, and the power out is proportional to like, so the area of the end layer, because power only comes out by coming out of the ends. So the energy divided by, so the power out is 1 over n times the energy in the whole thing. Does that make sense? So yeah, that's effectively what's going on there. And if you have, say, some kind of half-sealed mirror at the end, then it's whatever the reflectivity of that thing is. So it's very easy to alter the Q just by effectively making a, fabby, making a crappy fabby pro cavity or something like that, which is what you do, for example, if you saw a tentative signal. If you saw that, then you could try and zoom in on the mass range in which you saw it by making a reflective cavity and trying to narrow down your thing until it is all the way to 10 to the 6 or whatever, set by the axion line width. And then you'd be able to tune and say, OK, can we see this behaving as it would? Do we see the signal power going up as we tune our thing more and more? So that's a handle which is nice to have. ADMX's case, of course, yeah, they do a similar kind of thing. If they see a tentative signal, they tune back to there and see if it uh, persists and behaves as you'd expect. Um, yeah, OK. Uh, <laughs> go on. <laughs> that's right. 
So what they have is they do it in a way that's sort of extremely... Seven minutes left. I want you to talk oh, about <laughs> Anyway, so they have a copper rod sticking there on a sort of rotating thing. They rotate, they rotate this, and the copper rod moves position. So they're sticking like a little thing into the cavity and cha literally changing the gross shape of the cavity in little steps. It's, yeah, it's the simplest thing you can do, and it, and it works. Okay. Um, well, yeah. If not, then, uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, sure. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a few seconds oh, yeah. for... But apparently, yes. So thank you very much. And see you all tomorrow.